too. Hey, hey, thank you for tuning and tapping into the Venus Lounge, a platform dedicated to empowering women. I need y'all to come and jump into this vibe right quick and get some of this feminine energy, get into this frequency. I'm your host, Renee Moncada McElroy, producer, director, mother of four, wife, just an overall certified expert in life. Thank you very much. So to show my appreciation for you guys, I have a special guest that I just been stalking this woman for a long time. And so I need y'all to make sure you share this show. This is a really important show. Lots of information, very focused on the community and women, which is my favorite. So you can follow us on KPFA Radio on Facebook and Twitter. And KPFA 94.1 on Twitter, Twitch, TV, and YouTube. And you can also follow me, Renee Moncada, on my show platform at It's the Venus Lounge. And I'd like to welcome, this woman is bad, I'm going to just say that, Um, Nola Brantley, CEO of Nola Brantley Speaks, doing great work in the community, just around sex trafficking and exploitation of young women, boys, and the transgender community. Thank you for coming here today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Mm-hmm. I am glad to be here with you. Are you? Yeah, yes. pleasantly surprised. <laughs> I, like I said, I thought she was a church lady. And, you know, no offense to church ladies, but it was just a different vibe. Hallelujah. <laughs> I can be if you want me to. Hallelujah. God is good. Yes, he is. Won't he do it? He will. All the time, girl. <laughs> I, I, I have been watching your work, and I didn't know. I just found out today because I was reading your bio and your website that you are the co-founder of Missy. Yes, I am. You are busy. Yes. You're a mother of how many? Uh, I have a lot of kids. A that lot are biological. Of kids. Okay. The ones I had are three. Mothering doesn't always include coming out of you. That's like yes. let's just say I that. have three of them that three. are my my baby that have stuck by me. Yes. Yeah. Well, congratulations on that. Yes. You're an amazing woman. So I know you're probably even a more phenomenal woman. So let's talk about before we jump into the work that you're doing in the community. I'd like to know your story. Like, how did you, where did the calling come from to do this work? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, who we are is who we came into the world, you know, as. And so I I suppose that I was born a person that just is a humanitarian, Mm -hmm. you know, and so I believe in, you know, like our job while we're here is to evolve as an individual and then to help humanity. Yeah. You know, and so I don't think that I was able to figure that out right away because my life had a lot of trauma in the early part of it. But I think, you know, as I came back to myself and even as I was discovering that that trauma that I had experienced, that giving back was always part of my my, my journey. And then I think as I really began to, because people think I came to do this work because of my trauma, but I only even understood my trauma because I, I came to do this work. Ooh, so as I developed a deeper understanding of my trauma, then I became even more committed, you know, to doing the work for uh, personal reasons, but that wasn't, the original journey and that that's why I have so much compassion and understanding for people that are just showing up in this world a lot of ways whether that be mentally ill addicted or just like not fitting into the norm Mm -hmm. because if I didn't get into the field of work I got into I may not have ever understood my trauma Mm -hmm. so what does that mean for all these people that have been through like a lot of trauma in their life but haven't had any space in which to realize or understand that trauma's impact on their life do you think having that trauma in your life and also having work that, you know, for humanity is the path to healing. I think the path to healing is different for everybody. Everyone. And so I'm, I'm grateful for it, this path I've been able for to, you, to walk. Yes. Everyone that I know that has had trauma that has gotten to this work isn't necessarily walking a path to healing. I know someone right now that because they have not done their, their personal healing work outside of the field, they're in our field right now terrorizing hmm. adults and youth. You know what I mean? Because right. if you have unresolved trauma and it goes right. unresolved and for years and years, and you still got to work, you still got to And you're doing money. this kind of work, work, then what what does that manifest? So it just depends on you know your commitment to yourself. When I first start doing the work, I just threw my whole self into the work, and I didn't take care of myself. I didn't do my healing, and that had negative outcomes. When I came back from that and started really learning how to do the work hand in hand with doing my own work, that's when I was able to do some good work that was powerful and not harming myself further yeah. and not harming people in the community 
with good intentions. When you talk about work, when you say doing the work, what do you mean by that? I mean, whatever, you know, whatever the needs are in the community. And so right now, one of my focus is around missing black children in Oakland. So that's part of the work right now. I think for me, the work in the beginning was around the commercial sexual exploitation of kids. I think now where I'm positioned at, the work is around the deconstruction of structural racism and the recognition of the impact of historical oppression and the need for reparations and collective healing and the recognition that without that, things are only getting worse. So it sounds like there's different levels to what contributed to ex sexual exploitation. Um, what are some of those, the racism, poverty, how, how is well, that? Well, I mean, there's different levels in which contribute to a lot of the societal ills. Mm -hmm. So sexual exploitation is just one way it manifests. But yeah, if we take it all the way back, we're talking about historical oppression and the way that colonization and, you know, white supremacy has affected and black capitalism. folks. And capitalism is part of that whole white supremacist, yeah. you know, framework and slavery, right, in slavery. this country. And when it comes to women, too. Absolutely. Particularly black women. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the ideas about black women during slavery is what makes it possible for so many black women to be sex trafficked today. During slavery, kind of the bottom line was that black women were seen as consenting prostitutes. Mm -hmm. There were things that were said about them, like them having insatiable appetites for sex and being innately wicked. And, you know, um, you know, just all of these things that justify their rape and their breeding mm -hmm. and their sexual assault and abuse that was happening mm -hmm. during those times of slavery. And those ideas, sadly, have lived into today. And they've been perpetuated through the media, uh, through movies, through music, and through the actual treatment mm -hmm. of Black women and girls in American culture. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take a pause and just talk about Carly Russell when we're talking about the media. And she was the woman in Alabama who basically said she was she was on the freeway and she it was one o'clock in the morning and she saw a baby that was on the freeway and so a couple of days went by and different reports are coming out are you familiar with the story yeah i've been i've been what do you i've been you know following it lightly i not, i try not to get too captivated by saying sensationalized media stuff because i'm working on real problems saying that are happening in the community that i don't have to question yes. my feet are on the ground yes. and i can see people suffering yes. and i know I go out and do community outreach every Friday and I hug grandmothers and mothers every week who have people missing or people that have been murdered that they're suffering from. So because that has my full attention, mm -hmm. some of this stuff does not get as much, as much attention, mm -hmm. but I did see it, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, I don't know the full story. There could be so many factors at play. I, I know I feel that, if somebody's yeah. saying that they are missing and they're not or seeing babies that aren't there, they clearly have some mental health issues. Something's going okay, on. Okay, maybe she was on something. I don't know. <laughs> right. But that, that, that is not what I'm interested That's in. That's what I'm saying. That like, doesn't change the fact that we have a disproportionate number of black people missing, not only in the city of Oakland, but across the state and the nation. What are it the doesn't statistics? change historical oppression. It doesn't yeah, change yeah. structural racism, that one story. Well, the reason why I bring this one story up is because A, it ties into you being a guest today. So I thought it was timely on that. Yeah. People are, when people get interested on a hot, for something for a hot second, you know, this kind of help opens the door for further conversation, Absolutely. right? And so, this situation have multiple levels to it, like you said. Who knows? Because and we don't have yeah. all of the facts of the case. But I do know that I understand what the community was trying to do because we are doing some planning around those same kind of efforts here. Mm -hmm. So we're also planning. We're in the in the midst of meeting around launching a public awareness campaign around missing black kids in Oakland. But as part of that, we talked about launching a website and that website being for the purpose of Mm -hmm. people to go on there and post and report where they're not getting help with law enforcement. So what like, is this website? The idea behind the website, which is not up yet, okay. which is being developed, I see. is a lot of people, especially black people who have people missing, say they don't get the help that they need mm -hmm. and they don't get the attention that they need. Mm -hmm. So the idea is outside of law enforcement or in conjunction with law enforcement or in addition to law enforcement or instead of law enforcement, depending on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. We want to give people another place to be able to say, someone that I love is missing and to post their pictures and to say what, what, what outcome they're getting from law enforcement. Right. I called the police and it's been this many days where no one has responded because not too long ago when one of those kids got snatched in Oakland that was on the media, they, okay. they waited over 36 hours for the police to respond and they still didn't respond. And a woman who is part of our group that's on the police commission happens to know the family and was able to get a police to come to their house and take the report because of a personal connection. But what about all the other families that don't have 
those kind of connections when they have somebody missing. Right. Well, and one of the biggest issues is miscategorization. Because when you classify people as runaways, they don't look for them very much. Right. And a lot of so black kids like who are missing, voluntary. they so get they classified automatically. as runaways so automatically. It's, so automatically. it's the system, it's the intake process. It's structural racism. Mm. And we, we want to make things something else. We want to keep making them new. It's structural racism. If you look at the stats and the data, you know, it's structural what racism. What are the stats? Well, I mean, stats that say things like, you know, when you look at the prison population, mm -hmm. right? If you a black man or a black woman, you're way more likely to go to jail than if you're white. And it's not because you're way more likely to commit a crime. Mm -hmm. The stats show that too. Mm -hmm. If you could be a similarly, well, what they call a similarly situated person, mm -hmm. kind of same activity, doing the same things, showing up the same way in society. Mm -hmm. But if you're white, that's not gonna result in your criminalization. Right. But if you're black, there's a very good chance that it will. If you were Slump born you in 2001 like as a black man, there's a there's a one one in three black men that were born in 2001 have a lifetime likelihood of imprisonment. You see that? Wow. One in three. Right. Somebody in this room. There's right. three brothers in this room right, right. now. Right. And for so, black women that were born in 2001, it's one in 17. Those numbers are higher than they are for any other na nationality, and they double and triple the numbers you see for white folks. And it's not because black people commit more crimes or they're more criminals or they're badder people or none of that right. stuff. Because see, that's what it would lead you to believe. Mm -hmm. No, it's because of how the system responds to black people. You know, structural racism affects every part of our system. Every part of our society, Private every aspect. And public aspects of our society and yeah. culture. And until we deal with that, we're gonna keep talking about the same, same thing. Same thing over and over Right, yes. about the same thing that people just don't wanna face head on. Yes. What is it about that that they don't want to face it head on? I Why do I, they keep pointing the finger? I think for so long we got used to tap dancing around stuff. Mm -hmm. To be really honest, when black people did stuff, face stuff head on, there were really severe consequences like death, losing your children, yes, losing yes. your life. Everything. So mm -hmm. because of the consequences being so dire, I think people became very complacent. But look at the outcome. So I wanted to ask you about the statistics of missing people, women boys, transgender, like in the Bay Area alone, where do we rank? What are the statistics? We have been very focused on the statistics that are happening here in the city of Oakland. And it's not even easy to get all of the stats that we need here in Oakland. It's, so we're, well, that's another problem. We're still waiting on more stats. The stats we've been, we've been working off of has just been last year's numbers. And where do you get the stats the, from? The police department. Uh, that's where missing that's people the only are place? reported to. Is that the only that's place? where missing persons are reported to, right? And they're cross-reported sometimes with like child welfare, if they're foster care youth and all of that. But we haven't even gotten to that layer of data Can we yet. change the reporting system? Can there be another place? I mean, anything could be changed. Yeah. You know what I mean? But as of now, that's where we're getting those numbers okay, from. And so last year in the city of Oakland, because that's where we're focused on now, there were uh, like 1,498 missing persons reported. So like 1,500 missing persons reported in the city total. Of those 1,500, over 800 were black people. That's a lot. Of those 1,500, over 500 were black kids. You understand yes. so close to 900 total black people and included in that 900 number over 500 or, or black kids but this is the part that really uh you know is something to, to pay attention to when we first start talking about these numbers because they are very shocking people were like oh black girls and women are missing and that was the whole effort we had flyers talking about black women and girls being in danger doing outreach doing safety town halls that were focused on black women and girls and as i broke down the numbers and start looking at them more it was more black boys that were reported missing last yeah, year boys in Oakland. Too, yes. It was more black boys under 18 so last year what's that? that were reported missing in so Oakland. What does black that tell girls. you? Well, one, it tells us that we, we don't pay attention to what's happening with to black the boys. boys. One. And also that we have a hard time understanding that males as a gender also experience victimization. Yes, absolutely. And that we're not aware that people, one, they sex traffic boys too. Yes, yes, two, yes. especially in, in, in the in the, the wake of the Trump administration, the hateful people that were already li li lying dormant came full fledged. You think they wouldn't snatch a black boy from Oakland so and go take him somewhere and torture him? Yes, they would. And see, this is the darkness people don't want to think about. And that's when you do got to get high and take a drink. But it's the darkness that I understand because it's the work that I've done for so long. And I've met the kid that's been trapped in a cage. Understand? Wow. And so when black boys are missing, we should be asking that. Yeah. Where are they at? Where are they? Where are these who black boys them? at? Who has them and How? where are they at? Yeah. So when the black girls are missing, we were up in arms. 
they're with sex traffickers, they're being sex trafficked, they're being kidnapped. But where are the black boys too? Do we think the same thing that happens to boys that are children and girls that are children isn't very similar? You think they're saying, well, they're girls, so we'll do this to them. But they're boys, so we'll do that. No, at-risk and vulnerable kids are at-risk and vulnerable Period. kids. Period. Period. They just know black boys are an even better target. Because if people don't care about black girls, they definitely what you think about black boys, don't care about black they start boys. being scared of black boys when they're like five years old. Mm -hmm. So how could you worry about something and protect something that you start fearing in our society and culture when it's still in kindergarten? And so it's just, it's really deep, but it's unfortunate. It's so. deep. And I, I just want to, for those of you just joining us, you're watching the Venus Lounge, a podcast dedicated to empowering women. My guest today is Nola Brantley, CEO of Nola Brantley Speaks just a humanitarian and working in the space of the ever increasing sex trafficking and exploitation of young boys and women i was reading a statistic that said it's number three next to guns and drugs it's number two it's number two it now. used to be number three when we first started this work when when did you start in 2001 oh, I, yeah exactly that's yeah, good, 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 good research yeah yeah 2001 right. and probably about 2010 the fbi and law enforcement were reporting that it had surpassed the sale of um, drugs or weapons. I can't remember which one, but it was number two because those are the three drugs, weapons, and humans. And humans. And it had went to number two since so I started doing what this. Are the, what are the reasons for that? Well, the reasons are because once you sell drugs or a weapon, you sell the product and you need more product to sell. Now, if you have a 13 year old foster care use that no one's even looking for, you could sell her over and over and over and over and over and over money from selling her to invest into the drugs and the guns absolutely right so, so it's it what they call sense. a low cost high renewable profit crime yeah capitalism mm -hmm. at its finest at its finest and so for the for the girls for the age group uh what are you seeing is it across the board um the target age group like the age of entry kind of they target them between 12 and 14 but the age of you know those who are trafficked can be anywhere from nine years old to you know 99 years old because if you don't get out of it and you never have another opportunity, then that's where you end up stuck at. But you know, I think the big concentration of girls we see between the ages of, I'll say 15 and 35 would probably be the biggest concentration. Mm -hmm. um, but unfor you know, uh, uh, unfortunately there are children and that's my biggest concern yeah. it is about the children. The adults, um, we have to provide them with uh, uh, alternative options and adequate choices mm -hmm. for them to be able to make a different life for themselves. Mm -hmm the kids there's just there should be no exception they so how much does the uh, the i guess governmental agencies play a part in the situation because i i was talking to a friend of mine who told me during covid there were foster homes that were involved in the sex trafficking organizations well you know people are people mm -hmm. and government agencies are made up of human beings right human beings work everywhere and some right. of them it are don't good. Matter if you have a uniform and some or not. of them are bad. Right. Like you know where I mean? the church is. Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Matter. So absolutely bad things happen to kids in foster care. They happen to bad things happen to our uh, non-accompanied minors and immigrant children when they're in the immigrant detention facilities. You know, bad things happen to children who get adopted by nice Christian families. You know what I'm oh, saying? Like bad things happen to children because there are bad human beings and there are wonderful ones too. You know, but in terms of, you know, parents and how they could be more aware, I think one thing parents could pay attention to is their kids' online activity. Mm -hmm. Because nowadays, about half of the kids that are brought ask, into sex trafficking yeah, are recruited media. by someone online. Yes, pay attention to your kids' online activity, but better yet, have a relationship with your child. Yeah, have and, conversations with them. And, and again, these are issues that are more complicated, right? Because that's easy for us to say, but how do we say that to that mother that's working two jobs with three kids that's living in poverty that's barely making it? So a law passed back in 2017 that said all sixth through 12th graders are supposed to, in public schools are supposed to get prevention education on sex trafficking. That doesn't really happen that much in the schools, even so though a law passed. Like? What's that though? What well, that it means that? that they should be getting education on kind of what sex trafficking is, how it sounds, how to avoid it, what it looks like, who's at risk. So that if they run into this on the street, like they have a pimp that comes up and trying to run game on them, they have some idea of, oh, I know what this is. I learned about this in school. Right. This is not him wanting to give me a ride or give me a gift. This is really this thing. Or even if it's a family member trying to pressure them to do something, they're like, wait a minute. Uh, does, does I learned to be about in school? this. Can it be in other places? Well, it could be in other places too, but it has to be in places that are catch net places for kids. What's catch net? Where all kids go. Mm. That's why I said like public education. 
and where it's funded through the government. Well, what about the social media? What about TikTok? That they would be all one. on there. Well, th th they're there. I'll put some catch net. I videos think my daughter has learned a lot from things like TikTok, you know, yeah, and like about what? lots of issues. So yeah. I think that's one way, but I think TikTok is not as comprehensive as what they need to know. We could give them tidbits on something like TikTok. TikTok, but I think the kind of training that they need to have on something like this is more of a trauma informed training. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you're going to be training kids on sex trafficking and you're going to likely have many kids in your audiences mm -hmm, who've mm -hmm. also already been sexually abused. Speaking of training, I understand you have training and curriculum. Can you tell me about what that is on your website? I, I looked at that and I, there were some things on there I didn't quite understand, but you offer training and mm -hmm. you offer curriculum. So, what it, in what? Yeah, I offer a bunch of trainings. I offer about 40 different trainings. Um, and a large chunk of them are on commercial sexual exploitation. So everything from, you know, like commercial sexual exploitation, 101, 102, 103, harm reduction, healing shame. So, so many topics related to professionals or people in the community that are working with those who've experienced the commercial sex industry. And so do you do this training in person? Is it online? Both. I do it in person, online. I do it here locally. I also do it across the nation. And what is the curriculum? Is that for educators? Um, well, the curriculum is, there's a few curriculums. There's one that just teaches other folks how to teach the basic awareness curriculum in their own community. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a couple for youth. One is a prevention curriculum that teaches youth um, around, like what I was just talking about, how to avoid this. And then one is an intervention curriculum for working with youth who have already experienced sex trafficking and then kind of how you can work with them um, throughout their treatment time. How do you, how do you manage not getting fatigued? Because as a mom, I would probably go home and cry every night. Um, yeah, it's it, it, that the work could definitely be intense. And so it's been a journey to uh, figure out how to take care of myself as I do this work. But what I do like you do for your self-care? I really love nature. Okay. And so nature is a big part of my self-care. I was just uh, saying yesterday that I haven't been on a hike or to the beach in longer than is acceptable, at least to me. Mm -hmm. And so I planned a day this coming week, one for a hike and one for the beach. Mm -hmm. And so nature is just huge for me. Like it really uh, helps with my own healing journey and just puts a lot of things in perspective mm -hmm. for me. Mm -hmm. So I really appreciate that. Also just making sure like the, the pillars are taken care of. So trying to pay attention to the amount of sleep I'm getting mm -hmm. to make sure I'm getting appropriate sleep. Um, trying to, you know, make sure that I'm eating, like not being so encompassed in the work that I'm like, you know, missing meals, not drinking water, you know, not resting because there was a the time that I was doing I was going like to say that. it seemed like it could just be so uh, It can. You have to be very disciplined. You have to be very uh, like focused on your self-care. Do you, do you find, do you, uh, do you feel like you're able to detach a little bit? Because I would. No, I, I'm not really <sighs> able to detach. I mean. I mean, there, there's times I do have to turn it off so that I can yeah. enjoy other parts of my life and be present in other parts of my life. Mm -hmm. Because like right now when we're talking, a little girl's getting raped somewhere, but we're still having this conversation. Someone's starving to death somewhere, while somebody else is throwing away food, but we're still talking. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So I, mean, I, was I, have to, I have to be in that reality so that I can turn it off knowing that there, it's always going on, mm -hmm. you know, and I used to have a hard time just like, you know, staying, staying healthy and knowing all the things that were going on in the world. It would be very overwhelming. But when you get to that place, you could become immobilized and then you're not able to be helpful or be hopeful. It's, and it's, so I find that, you know, enjoying my own life, having my own connections and relationships, spending time in nature. And you're only one person. Exactly. You're able to do one thing. Is there a spiritual aspect to this that you look at in terms of like, you talk about traumas and lessons and purpose and, you know, do you, do you reconcile that with spirituality in any way in terms of your experiences or other experiences? In, of, I mean, I just rec people? reconcile it with the, 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 this, this journey that we're on called life. You know what yeah, I mean? Like you you like never know. We could wake up tomorrow. You could wake up tomorrow. I could wake up tomorrow and everything could be different. Mm -hmm. So just trying to stay in the present moment, appreciate just the small things. You know? yes. And so that just uh, being able to ride the waves of life and, you know, not get Absolutely. too overwhelmed by the highs or the lows, I think, mm -hmm. is really helpful for me, especially mm -hmm. in doing this kind of work that we do. But I also, you know, sometimes, like I said, I find lots of different ways to turn it off. I love to travel. That's like a big deal for me. And I have other ways that I turn off. They're probably not the healthiest ways in the world, but definitely necessary. <laughs> yeah. We talk about health, coping. Sometimes coping is healthy. Sometimes it's unhealthy. Mm -hmm. But even when it's unhealthy, sometimes it's still helpful. And you have an awareness that it's not. Yeah. So, you know, I try to yeah. keep, I try to keep it mixed up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Diversify. <laughs> so, so how do you, it just would seem like, 
over time do you think it's gotten worse because of technology i, I feel like it's mm -hmm. just a yeah. mountain of issues yeah i mean i definitely i had left open for 10 years and went to los angeles to help them establish their human trafficking efforts and when i left oakland i feel like we were on a really good pathway to turning this issue around mm -hmm. uh, systemically and within the community and so when I came and when back, was this? What year this was, was this? I left in 2015. Okay. So when I came back in 2021, I was okay. really shocked. Yeah. What I happened? was like, wow. What happened? I was like, wow. Like this. This off the hook. I think technology plays into it. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that is part of it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it was just technology. I also think I came back post pandemic. Mm -hmm. So I think the pandemic made things sure. definitely Exacerbated worse for people. Yeah. Um, and then Oakland has been going through a serious gentrification over the past like decade almost and so i think as that has become more and more of a reality and more and more people have been pushed out of kind of pushed it off to the side that it's, it's made this a bigger and bigger problem in the city of oakland and also as more people get to know that you could come to oakland and do this they and come in and you're going to be able to get away with it why not go where you can get where does oakland it? rank in terms of the statistics it's one of the five top cities for um child sex trafficking in the country so I ranked up there with Do New York. Do y'all hear that? It ranks up five. there with New York, Los Angeles. Um, there's New York, Los Angeles, Oakland, Florida, and Atlanta. Yeah, I saw it. This was Texas. Yeah. Yep, Atlanta. Yeah. Yep. I notice when I travel in the airports, I'm seeing in the women's bathroom, um, like, you, you know, if you're here. Yeah, I'm probably, happy to see that. So uh -huh. that let me know. I'm like, okay, this is a real problem. Yeah, I'm really happy to see that. Stuff. Yeah, I see it in the bus station. Those were legislative airports. moves that got those things up yeah. in those places. Yeah, yeah, so because those are the transportation exactly, and they're places, also in bars. They, move them they also have to be in all the bathrooms at bars. bars. So that's yeah, a good one because too. Because they move yeah. them around exactly. So what is you? What is the sort of? How does the recruiting happen? How do they groom them? Like what? Oh the yeah, movement? so like this, they. Rec I mean, a lot of the recruiting happens. Well, first of all, they focus on youth who are you know um, marginalized or at risk. So. Foster people that aren't they think foster no one's care youth are a big target because a lot of foster youth they're really desperate for family and love and material things yeah our lgbtq youth are a big target because they could feel Sense so belonging reject it yet from their families and communities and they throw them away and throw them out the house so often that they become homeless so they have to engage in survival sex which mm -hmm. then can lead to being sex trafficked mm -hmm. you have your youth who are living in extreme poverty you have traffickers that will focus on the, the fact that they're living in poverty and try to offer them things that their families can't right. can't offer Money, them clothes, whatever, whatever there whatever is drugs. you have a lot of you have a lot of kids who have experienced sexual abuse yeah. and so sex trafficking is almost like sexual abuse on steroids but it's definitely sex trafficking would be on the continuum of sexual abuse sexual exploitation and then commercial sexual exploitation what's commercial which is sex trafficking that's when people are making a profit off of your it's sexual like a abuse. business. And sexual exploitation is like you're you're 15 with some dude who's 25 and he's giving you rides to school and giving you lunch money uh, and having sex with you. You understand? Yeah. So he's benefiting sexually and by and providing for some of your basic needs. Mm -hmm. But he's not making a profit off of you. Mm -hmm. Commercial sexual exploitation. Gotcha. Now you have a third party involved that's actually making a profit off of you. So you have a lot of kids that have been sexually abused, so they have this link between love, sex, and abuse. But you also have a lot of kids that are just desperate for love. You know, I was 13 years old, the first time I came to my mom and asked her why she had never said that she loved me. Mm -hmm. And so in the 13 years that were, were coming before that, you know, there was a void that was growing inside of me and a desperation for love that I spent lots of years after that trying to feel. You know, and it was like wanting to be loved no matter what the cost. And I wish that was my story alone. But sadly, that's been the story of so many children that I've met, just so desperate for love. And like, people are like, well, don't they know that's not love? Well, no, they don't, dumbasses. They don't, right. Because they you never define had. love how you experience it. Love. So yeah. if the only love they've experienced has been that kind of love, then that's how they're defining it. They don't know what it is except for what it's been presented to. And if they haven't had no healthy love, then the unhealthy love is what they're accepting as love. And that could be someone getting hooked on a relationship like that when they're 14 and we meet them when they're 34 and say, well, when did this all get started for you? And they start talking about when they were 12 and left home because they were being sexually abused and then were 14 and met this person. And now we meet them many, many years yet later and they're still being sex trafficked or now they're not being trafficked. Maybe they're drug addicted and now they're just in the commercial sex industry as what people call a common prostitute. But that's not how it started. Yeah, I don't hardly ever meet anybody that's involved in prostitution where it was a conscious 
choice they made you know what, that, amongst other options. Gonna now you say, got a few white women. I was gonna ask you. You got that. a few white women that, 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 that got that. options that still, for whatever reason, and I'm not even judging them, that choose. They could they have a college degree. They don't represent the majority when we're talking about people that are experiencing like exploitation. They right. represent a small little group right. while the rest of the 99 people are in poverty, have been abused, are desperate for love. And so, then 1% have all these options, but still decide to have sex for money, and I'm not judging them. I, I, I want to believe I, that there's something in me that always wants to believe to vibe about women and women empowerment and having an autonomy. There's always this part of me that wants to believe that women who are sex workers or engage in sex for money, you can break that and all If the way it was down. truly an option in our society and it was truly something that was women were choosing that weren't in such desperate situations, that's then not, I would entertain I, it. I, I, that, but that's my question. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. It, it, but, it's, just, it's just not the reality of the situation, like I said. But if one we have has enough, nothing to do with the other one either, right? Well, because, no, because we're talking about two completely different people. Right. But I'm saying... One is people that have options and decide and to decide, do something. I'm gonna do this. And the other one are marginalized people right. that experience structural racism, okay, oppression, okay, and everything I hear else. What you're saying. And are only They're doing not mutually it because, exclusive. Yes. I get it. Yeah. So we focusing on that 99% because well, that, that's our job, right? Yeah. To, to represent those who I, I are absolutely. not being represented. You, you those those other ones, they'll get platforms to talk about how they want to do it, so that could justify it for for those who want to buy it. So they get those platforms. They get those platforms. For those who buy they get those platforms for sure. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and and as we think about people buying sex, just to put this out there, even as you're watching pornography, right? Because I'm I'm very sexually open and free. And if I could watch pornography and be sure I wasn't watching other people suffering, I certainly sure would watch it. Yeah, but you can't do things dominated. like you can't do things like watch pornography or buy sex in the commercial sex industry and not not you don't know yeah. if you're doing it with someone who's a consenting choosing adult or more likely with I'm somebody who's being forced, the money. with someone yeah. who has no options with somebody who is being is suffering. That's most likely what you get when you make the purchase in the commercial sex industry. Well, something stuck in my head that you said um, when you were 13, you went to your mom and you asked her why she didn't love you. At what point in your life did you figure out what that was? When you found that you were lovable or that you experienced love? Well, I mean, I think it has been such a journey, you know what I mean, to, to figure all that out. I mean, I think when I first truly understood what love was was when I had my first my first kid. I was gonna say. Yeah, and that, that it's, it's a really interesting experience. You understand what love is, but you also have a greater understanding of what the things you didn't get and, and you know and, and kind of what you want to give your little ones but because of things like generational trauma sometimes the ideas you have and the delivery can be off you know i'm glad that i've been able to give my kids much more than my mom was able to give me but my Absolutely. mom gave us way more well, than she, she was able to get it, my right. mom went into the new york state foster care system when she was three years old in 1941 into an orphanage mm. where they were being run by german house mothers and she was being called a puerto rican nigger on a daily basis so, you know, we none of us went into foster care. You know what I mean? So I'm very, very grateful for that. And when I when I did come to my mom and say that, you know, her response, it didn't it didn't help at the time because I, I, I the, the the void was there. Right. But it was still time. a kind response because she said, I'm, I can't give you what I never had. Aww. So the response was kind, but it just did it wasn't helpful. Still didn't fill you at up. the time. Yeah, the yeah. hole was still. It wasn't there. helpful. But my mom lives with me right now. She's 84 years oh, old, still alive. Right? And and lives in, in, in my home with me. Is she, so is she proud of you the type of work? Oh yeah, doing? she's so proud of me. She's always been proud of me. Ever since I've been uh like a student in school, she's always just been really, really proud of me. So And I know your yes. children are, are proud of you. Oh yeah, also. my kids are always proud of me. My kids are great. How do you balance that working in this type of space and not very well with the boys. The, the boys are twenty five and twenty six. Yeah. And unfortunately when I was raising them I was also understanding my own trauma. And I was getting so much positive reinforcement at work. Mm -hmm from what I was doing, people don't, uh, it, when you're burning yourself out, people don't necessarily see that. Mm -hmm. they, they, they like, they just be like get girl, it, girl. you're grinding, girl, And yes. so that was such a source yeah. of having like positive reinforcement and sometimes raising my positive kids. Positive reinforcement in the burnout. Yes, and sometimes raising my kids brought up some of those challenges. Mm -hmm. So it was almost easier to be at work. You know, and so I was at work all the time. you're making money, you're being productive. Not very much, but I was more but getting I, the, you know it was I'm more saying. of the affirmation right. like the, the, um, the notoriety, right? Of, of the position and of being so important in the community. And so I, I had a lot of time from my, my boy's life that I was absent, like at work, not absent partying, but just absent like at work. But it doesn't matter for kids. When you're absent, yeah, you're just and absent. You're there. And so, even when you're there being present. You yeah, and I didn't realize that when I was raising them. I didn't realize yeah. that until I had their sister yeah. nine years later. Just more time, more space, more knowledge. 
and start raising her and realize, wow, right? These are all the times I wasn't around for them. Like right. they was on their own, on you know, latchkey own. kids. Right? No, yeah. It was on their own, just you know, living their life. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. I just like, wow, okay. You know what I mean? Do you think so, just maintaining children is the same as raising them? And, and I was measuring them based on the kids I was working with. Like, yeah. oh, they're not getting sexually abused. Yeah. They're not homeless. Right. The they're not getting beat. They, they good. good. They, they clothes is good. They need. They make, clean. Their kids, beds is made. And kids need us. They don't care. They love we our don't. attention, oh my God. our time. I mean, my kids still be like that. They my, want time. Even my adult kids now, they're still the same yeah. way. You know, they're still, I mean, one's not talking to me right now, but I still love you, Baba. Uh, Hi, Baba. <laughs> right. We still love Your you. Your mama loves you, yeah, Baba. He's in the computer engineering program this summer. He's, I'm doing a internship with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission because I still keep up with him. Okay. But he mad at me, but I still love him. Okay. But bottom line is, when he comes back around, he'll be the same way, like my 26 year old is. Even, and my 17 year old. Even my adult kids and my almost adult kids, they still want my love and attention and my time. Yes. So imagine how much they needed it then. You know, yes. so, but with my daughter, it been, never stops. Yeah, I've been a little bit better. Go away. I still start but, to do some know, of the same but, things but for her. Mom, but girls are human. more aggressive. So she yeah. didn't let me do the same thing. She yes. started acting out and was like, you know why I'm acting out? Because you're she's not like here. You she, she said, I know you're at work, but I don't care. Like she literally said that to yeah. me. You know, so I was able to, uh, and then pandemic helped. Pandemic sat my ass more down. Time. Before pandemic, like 60% of my work time was travel. So then pandemic, I was like, oh my God. Did you settle into motherhood though? Just having the type of job. Oh, I've always settled into motherhood since okay. the first day I ever got pregnant some with a baby. Some people some women don't. Oh, no, I'm a mother to the core. To the core. Yeah, I like too. all of it. Natural births, breastfeeding, yes. you know, mothers of other people's children, yes. all of it. And I love being a mother. Mother is the greatest role I'll ever have in my lifetime. I'm with you on that. Yeah. Cheers to that, especially because <laughs> you water. Cheers to that. I agree. So tell me how, what's a day-to-day -day life for you? on this side of things in your professional yeah. career? Yeah, I mean, it varies day to day, but like some days I'll spend the day on Zoom training, um, different audiences like yesterday, no, so this morning, for example, this morning, I spent my morning training some folks that work at a homeless um, organization, you know, Covenant House, they're pretty mm -hmm. popular across the nation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, they have them across the nation. So I've been training oh, Covenant okay. House in New York okay. for the past few years. I they're human there. trafficking Covenant team. House. Yep, so I've been training them. Um, today we trained on working with trauma survivors in professional settings. Mm -hmm. um, I had a meeting with my old event coordinator from Missy to just kind of talk about, you know, some possibilities for the future. I was supposed to meet up with one of the moms of, of one of my kids that I do group for to talk about recovery, because this young lady herself wants to be clean, but the only way to connect with mom is through using together. And so she figures if we could get mom clean, then maybe she has a chance of getting clean too. No, and this is just a teenager. Girl, yeah. Just a teenager. How these are the she? things. She's only so, 17. Tell me. And the these story. are the things these kids be dealing with. You feel me? Yeah. And so I was gonna meet up with her moms today. It didn't work out. But mom I think, didn't show up. The mom. No, she did not show up. She she didn't respond. But you know, one time I didn't respond too. So it just could have been. You know, she got busy. I'm very hopeful that we're gonna connect and we gonna we gonna talk about working some things out. So I'm excited about that. I love how non-judgmental you are. I mean, people are living life. They're going through stuff. You never I know what somebody's that. going yeah. through. You feel it, me? It, and people could be different every day. Like. I could like get drunk and, and, and do ecstasy today and tomorrow I could go out into the community and on, on a 99 degree day and pass out water to people to make sure people don't have heat strokes. They're not exclusive either. You understand? No, yes, absolutely. Like to you be can, human and to be human. People are taught that if you can't be perfect, then you can't be do anything good. Mm -hmm. You know, so once if you're doing anything bad, then you might as well just do everything bad. Right. When I don't think we should be made to Looking feel that way. Looking at people is so one dimensional. We or are so holding more them to than such that. a standard. Like if you do this in your professional life, you should be held up to the same standard. Oh yeah, people get real disappointed with life. me. They get yeah. real disappointed. Like no, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm still human. All right. I still, still have my life. Yeah. yeah so it's I definitely no. That's definitely people want it. What you said is about the one dimensional. That's it. it. Yeah. People have a hard time understanding. And we're, we're Especially not mothers. Yeah. We're just human beings. We're just yes. not one dimensional as human beings, period. We have many, many different aspects and some, to us. And then sometimes you go through periods too, where you could be on a stretch and everything is great. And then you might go through a period where it's just like every day is a struggle. Absolutely. And I'm just like, I'm not, I, I fell off and I'm just doing the best that I can. And so what? And then like, well, that's said, why we can't have all that judgment around people because yeah, with, with the lack of judgment and more compassion, people can come up out of those low and dark places to somewhere new, but it's the judgment and compassion lack of compassion and the lot like a lot of judgment i think that keeps people in those low judgment places. and compassion that's why we're here at the venus lounge you know what i'm saying that feminine <laughs> energy just that compassion that non-judgment the mothering the caring that we give 
to each other, um, especially now, is like really needed. It's so needed. So tell me what's next for the organization. Like, I know you, I, when I was looking on your website, you had a few different sort of campaigns that you were working on. Yeah, well, there's, a, I mean, I'm going to continue to train just because that's just like such a needed, you know, thing. So I, I, that's probably the biggest piece of what I do is I train almost every day of the week, you know, or at least Monday through Friday not the weekends, but almost every day of the week I'm training, you know, somewhere, either training in person like or online. Individuals, organizations? Uh-huh, organizations, individuals, you know, on different topics, mostly training like therapists, social workers, probation officers, law enforcement officers, case managers, advocates, foster care parents, you know, basically all those folks that care for our at-risk and vulnerable youth and young adults are the folks that I'm, I'm training. In general, do you think people really care? Like, in general, are there... I think people want to care. Mm -hmm. But, like, in order to care, you have to first be able to care for yourself. Mm -hmm. You're probably thinking about Word on the Street. Yeah, Word, Word on the Street. On the street. Is, street. That's the prevention curriculum okay. that we go around and, and I train like, on. I yeah. like that one. That's a, the yeah. kids really enjoy that one, too. It's really helpful to, for them. So I'm going to continue to train because training is needed. And the goal is to really spread the trainings across the nation. So the pandemic has opened up some doors. I was able to get it out to Texas, to... Maine to uh, Vermont to Wisconsin and these places actually I would to go to many of these places in person mm -hmm. um, at the end of the pandemic after I did some stuff online with them mm -hmm. so really making sure places that are just starting on this journey are not starting from scratch mm -hmm. that they have some information to start from so I'm doing mm -hmm. that one thing I started off doing this year and I fell off and I've been you know it's my first year I actually actually attempted to do it is writing a book mm -hmm. oh, people have like really, really wanted to be to write a book for a long time um, but I wasn't ready. But this year I felt like I was ready to do it. And I started to write and it's just a lot. Like it's a lot. Because you like, got to go down that road. Well, it's just a lot. Like, and it's not, it's not only a lot for me. It's going to be a lot for other people. Like I like was a lot. What do you I mean? I was a like, very, like, like, like I was a child. A lot, or? I remembered everything as a child. Like I remember stuff and I was like a smart, like I was thinking about things at a young age. So like, I was like, thinking, what do you mean? Like about a, inappropriate adults, like inappropriate things that were going on and people and systems and like, like even when I, oh, like, everything. Like everything. Like everything. Like so I was, th I was seeing things from... and thinking about things. And so okay. as I started to so write exposure. the book, you yeah, had like so many little details of things that were going on, even within the, the sphere of my family. Are you writing this book from a little you or a big you? Ooh, ooh I'm writing this, this book from... I think um, ooh, ooh. she's a loss of words. Look at that. Yeah, because it's, it's, go, it's going back and forth as I've started it. Okay, I it's, got I'm you. writing it from the very beginning of my life mm. and then using the experiences I've had throughout my life doing this work to kind of reflect on some of those experiences. I see. You know what I mean? So that they're my experience. So the book's about me, but it's not really about me. It's about me and all of those people that have had experiences like me. I see. So you're taking some of the experiences that you've had in your life and then some that you've met with people kind of tying them but they have together. so many details to them you know like if i could share yeah. one with you for example Please, I, was, I was gonna ask yes. you tell me so the story an tell so me a story i was writing the book as an example right and i was like this is so deep when i was three years old my mom married my stepdad who was a white man. my mom i already heard been, enough she's right been there. well known in the gay community throughout okay, her life i heard enough so she used to be a mistress at sutro's bathhouse in san francisco oh, i'll take a sip but so, keep the camera on her so sutro's was a bathhouse that gave at I that remember time sutro's okay bathhouse. Well, mistress rita is who they threw parties. i remember they threw parties in my mom's name at that time Stop. At the she, she was there, yeah she was beach. big amongst the gay male community okay so she meets my stepdad at this bathhouse he was bisexual and they end up getting married and we leave the city and how old were you i was three we leave the city to go to the San Joaquin Valley where his family's at because we're going to move on a farm with his family. That sounds suspect Caveat. already right oh, this, was, this was the problem. That Hold on. sounds suspect We get already. there to the farm with all of our stuff in the U-Haul and we're sitting on this long ass log outside the farm because he forgot to tell his father that his Puerto Rican wife had, had a two baby. half black children. Mm. His father was a racist. Mm. Mm -hmm. So we sat out on that log until the sun went down. And his father finally said, okay, well, let the, basically let the two little niggas in and put us in a back room in the house. And then had my mom and my stepdad sleep in a trailer on the field for bringing the niggas to the farm. Mm -hmm. And then you, we, so we lived what on that What year farm. was this? 1977? I'm 47 and I was, you know, about three at the time. Yeah, so we talked 70 about. 70 something. Yeah, so a few years later, we were still on that farm. A few years later, I remember the fire department coming out. And long story short, the 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 grand the step grandfather now the racist step grandfather the, the the boyfriend's daddy the husband's daddy my mom's husband's, daddy. husband's daddy he tried to blow up the whole farm just to kill us 
He was trying to blow up the whole farm. Wrong? So they had to come out there and they had to disconnect some stuff. Like he was trying to blow up the farm. And when when he when he he was upfront about why he was trying to blow up the farm. Because he was an outright racist. You know what I, I was gonna and say? And so just these little experiences that shape you yes, as you grow up. The experience up. always come from like whenever I hear about these types of atrocities and terrorism that happen to us, the emphasis always is on our experience, but no one ever examines the oppressor, like what's going on with them that they have to keep doing this century after century. What's in well, the obviously psychology? they've been hurt. They've been hurt. They've been hurt. Right. So why I'm tired of people always focusing on our traumas and our history. Yeah, no, it's their sickness. It's, it's always so. Can we shine the light yeah. on that? Like, yeah. how are you gonna blow up a house with children in he it? He was an alcoholic. One, he was okay. an alcoholic. Okay. And two, he must have had his own deep. deep but what's trauma. up with the? If like, let's call like racism I is just this thing that, that kind of happens to black people, and, and it's over here, and it's an experience. But let's call it what it is. Yeah. White supremacy. The, the level of delusion yeah. and insecurity and like, what's that? Yeah, and he didn't go to jail. Of course. The police and the fire department had to come out there. They had to disconnect stuff and all that. And he said what he was doing. And then the <laughs> around racism and the fact that your mom's boyfriend knew about what his father. He was abused, though. He was abused by his father. Yeah. Because he was gay, his father had abused him, which was how he ended up in San Francisco at Sutro's bathhouse. You understand? So he was abused See. himself. He was scared to go back there probably alone. <laughs> so he came back with my mom and took Hoping this, <laughs> this, this woman would save his life. <laughs> Trying to be a distraction. <laughs> a distraction. Oh, this. So are there, in your experience, um, doing this type of work, you know, saving and rescuing? I don't, I don't save. I don't rescue. Okay. I'm sorry. Yeah. What? What is... Uh, Sometimes I help recover. Recover. I walk alongside. So, okay, I support. walk along. Walk alongside. Support. Encourage. All that. Bring resources to. That too. Give hope. Help. Help. Um, <laughs> salvation. But people save themselves and they rescue themselves. Right, but you bring them the resources. Absolutely. So, so what is a success story? Oh, so many. So Thank I, you. I so yeah. Oh, so many. But I mean, like, I mean, there's just so many. As soon as you say that, so one I could think of is a young lady who grew up in the foster care system for a good chunk of her life. Um, when I met her, she was about 15 and she had been being trafficked since about the age of 10 years old. Um, and she was a part of child welfare system. Um, she was also to the attention of the probation system at this time. She had come into the child welfare assessment center and before they placed her into another group home or foster care home, which she was just going to run away from, they brought her in to see me. And so she was connected with the program and they put her in a home and she ran away like she always did, mm -hmm. but she had our number and we had hers. So we kept in contact with her and um, she was also on probation. And so we started to work with her um, and she wanted to, her initial goals was that she wanted to get off probation mm -hmm. and get the hell away from all of us as fast as she could. Her, Why? What? Well, just because, you know, yeah, we you have the system to her. Yeah, yeah. yeah, her okay. father was in jail. Her mother was on drugs and was just on the streets of Oakland, you know, mm -hmm. and she had just been in foster care her whole life and had been suffering. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. she didn't trust people. Yeah. You know what I mean? I so see that. Um, anyway, she started working with the program and she did get off probation. Mm. But when she got off probation, by then she had built a relationship with the people in the program and she didn't want to get the hell away from us. So then she decided she wanted to get her GED. So she got her GED. How old was she at this point? At this point, she's like, you know, 16, So she's been 17. like six years. Yep. So now she wants to get her GED. So she gets it. After she gets her GED, she decides she wants to go for her high school diploma. So she goes to an AmeriCorps school mm -hmm. and she graduates as valedictorian of her class, wow. talks at the graduation, gets her high school diploma. Then she decides she wants to work at an organization in the community. So I hired her at an organization in the community and she worked there for a couple of years. Then she decided she wants to go to a university. So she got accepted to a university on the East Coast, took her you know, double the average time, but who cares? Most foster care youth never go to college at all, period. So it took her double the regular time to graduate, but she did with straight A's valedictorian of the college, picked her up in the airport, you know, in the state where her college is at because wow. she had straight A's upon graduation. So then she said she wanted to get a job in our field, got a job at one of the child advocacy centers in our nation. Then she wanted to get married and have a baby. She got married and had a baby. And, you know, and now she's dealing with all of the, you know, the, the ups and downs of life as we all do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But, and she's a, a, from what I can see, and I'll be hopefully seeing her next month where, I, where I'm going to visit, where she's going to be at. Um, but from what I could see, she's a wonderful mother. I also went to go see her after she graduated from college. And, you know, she was really just thriving. 
And so she, that's a huge success story. You know what I mean? This is a child that had no parents that grew up in the system mm -hmm. that has defied every statistic that was set up to mm -hmm. say that she would not do. She's been able to do all of those things. And, and so, the biggest. Yeah, there's another girl I just want to yeah. mention. Another. How about you? How about, the, how about you being a mother and coming through still smiling, bright eyes are bright, doing this type of work? Like, yeah, I mean, I'm happy that I'm, I'm successful, you know. Yes. Um, I just want to say a couple things about success. Success doesn't equate healing. I'm, I'm, I'm fortunate I've been able to experience both healing and success. You can be very successful and very unhealed. Oh, and that's not on a continuum. When either. I was able to hide the fact that I wasn't experiencing healing by my success. That's why I mentioned that. No, just I to encourage it. successful people. But it doesn't mean just being successful in terms of your career or your job. Exactly. Because, that's what I'm trying to emphasize. Yeah, no, I, success, I'm seeing it as being, a, a large, being happy exactly. and pleased with Ex something that exactly. you did and you're happy with it. And it yes. could be for a minute. It could be for a day. Absolutely. It doesn't mean like, no, six, I define yes. success as being pleased and happy with me something too. that you put your time yes, into me too. and you are happy with it, whether yes. the success of us meeting yes. together it doesn't have to be this long, big, grand Absolutely. type of thing. I would just like to see more people that have experiences like my minds have the opportunity to be successful. Uh, and so, okay. like, sometimes, like, I'm glad I'm successful, but I don't like for not you because I know you already understand this stuff. But for people that don't understand this stuff. No. And they're yeah. like, oh, well, Nola got had all this trauma, but she made it. No. And then that's how they look down on people that have had my similar right. experiences and don't make it. So I that's tell people, right. I that's am right. the exception. I'm not the, the rule. rule. I'm yes. trying to create the rule to be more like my experience. More you know what I mean? But that's really the exception, not the rule. So mm -hmm. I want more people that have had difficult experiences that have experienced trauma to be able to come to the other side of that because then they can contribute greatly to the community. Mm -hmm. You guys were watching, you're watching the Venus Lounge. I'm your host, Renee Moncada. I have my special guest here, Nola Brantley, CEO of Nola Brantley Speaks. She's a humanitarian and just doing great work against sex trafficking and the exploitation of young women and boys and the transgender community. Where, uh, um, so say someone is experiencing this or they have a family member, what's the first thing that they should do? Is there a number to call? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it depends on where they're at, right? Like, what do you um, mean where they're at? Like, I mean, like, in terms levels? of what numbers to call. So, like, there's a national hotline, okay. the National Human Trafficking Resource Hotline, okay. and they can call that or go online to the National Human Trafficking Resource Hotline website, but... I feel like get, having local numbers is always more helpful right. than having national numbers. So if they look for... So like if they're in Alameda County, for example, okay. right, um, where we're at, they can call a few organizations. There is Bay Area Women Against Rape okay. called Bay War. Mm -hmm. And Bay War has a program specifically that works with survivors and victims of sex trafficking and also of just sexual assault and sexual abuse too. There's another organization... Um, in Alameda County called Love Never Fails. I know, I, I looked at Vanessa. Like, yeah. And not only do they do provide you know services, them? Uh, of course. Can we, can we bring I, them yeah, back? I know everybody. Okay. okay. And anyone that works in this arena back. of sex trafficking, I okay, know. Okay. Okay. Um, so okay. Vanessa, not only do they offer programs, they offer shelter. They have housing for I, kids I saw and adults. Yes. And they have a, I don't use this word, but they have a search and rescue program. I saw where they that actually they go find in and kids get, that are missing. Yes. Yeah. So I would call it search and recovery if it was up to me to name it. Search and but recovery. it's still a beautiful thing to do. Because so, you say you don't rescue. Uh, no, what rescue is what you do for the rest of your life. You know what I'm saying? How are you going to rescue somebody when they have the rest of their life to figure things out? Right. Yeah. Right. But yeah, Vanessa at Love Never Fails, they do some good work. She also has the IT biz program where they're putting people through technology training so they can have real opportunities and real jobs to get out of, you know, a more difficult life. I so like she's that. doing a lot over there. Well, I just wanted to thank you for, for coming. I've learned something. Um, I mean, a few things just by talking with you. Um, one thing like I I had not really judgment, just misconceptions around like, you know, being a mother and looking after my kids and like, I'm not going to let my kids do that. And I'm monitoring my daughters and not realizing that there are certain privileges or situations that I've had that enable me to do that as a mother, just exactly. not being a victim of, you know, sexual exploitation or any type of like sexual things happening in my life. You know, that's number one. Um, and other issues. So I always looked at it as like, you're not watching, you need to watch your kids. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I just learned that it's not always that, like, even if you are doing, we all doing the best as, as we can as mothers. And there's so many different things out there that are battling against you. So just because you see kids walking alone or someone is, doesn't come home, you can't always blame the parents. It's the, it's the system that they're, 
that they are victims of. It's different circumstances that have had generation generational impact on absolutely why and so stop blaming each other. Yeah. Like I learned, like I'm, I'm things aren't this way by chance. They're this by, way by design. By design. Uh. Yes, but even sometimes, like <laughs> even when we were talking about the the girl, what was her name, Carly, Carrie Russell. Yeah. Like even that, like people going on Twitter and making their judgments about it. Like she should have did this and did that. Like even us sometimes as black people, we don't understand. Even in our response, is sometimes victim. Yeah, you know, know what I want black people to do? Get involved. Get involved. Okay, because as I've been doing this work around missing black kids in Oakland. In the beginning, when we first start recognizing it and calling the emergency meeting, you know, like a lot of folks were showing up. If that was my daughter, my cousin, my sister, my brother, my nephew, I would be on the front lines. But so, no one's going to care about black folks if black folks don't care about themselves. You. That was the so point. If we're I was not making, showing up, if we point. can't show up consistently for a couple of months to spread this awareness in the community as black people, then how do Who we else think is anybody going else is going to care exactly. about us? And so there's a lot of distractions in our society and culture. Yeah, absolutely. So people get very distracted. You know, yeah. and it's hard to, you know, sometimes pay attention to the things that we really need to be putting our focus on. I would love to set up some type of fundraising effort, being visible in the community, something that we can do to, you know, take another step. And yeah, there's some one people, more people involved. There are some campaigns that are coming up around the black uh, kid safety around trying to distribute things like air tags and. I think social like, media I would training like to, to see just more uh visual stuff out in the community well that's what like we, we, we started meeting about a month ago yeah. to uh strategize around a public awareness campaign a public awareness campaign so billboards and then who, what kind of people we can get to like graphic designers yeah you know, people who are in the printing business that can help volunteer their time and their effort it sounds all good but honey i struggle to get 500 Girl, copies every friday really know. just to take the, put the safety flyers out there every friday i'm really trying know. to beg for someone just to copy 500 flyers to put the safety flyers on the street to say black kids is missing right so all that sounds good and people don't but show I just up. 500 flyers for fridays right right no mm -hmm. i hear you people don't show up i thank you for doing your work yeah, i really you appreciate highlighting you. this issue yeah i really appreciate you coming down you really lifted my spirit and um i would love to continue this conversation and see what more we can do to help with your for-profit organization mm -hmm. And this is the Venus Lounge. Thank you guys for joining us. I really encourage you to go to her website, Nola Brantley Speaks, and just see what you can do. If it was your sister, your brother, your niece, your nephew, you guys would want them putting efforts. And this is our this is our family. This is our community. So do your part. Thank you for joining us. We love you. Good night. <laughs>